Megan, Jane, Crab. Thank you for coming on Under the Skin with me, Russell Brand. I'm so grateful that you're here. Thank you for having me. Slightly surreal. Is it really? A tiny bit. You're off the telly. It's me, Russell, off the telly, <laughs> but you are off the internet and we live in a, a, a shifting landscape where you have you have like a lot of Instagram followers, more than a million, and I feel like you're very engaged with Instagram. You're a published mm. author and I feel like you're an important voice in, in some interesting areas around uh, sexuality, eating capitalism consumerism body image lots of lots of things that i'm really interested in so i'm excited to talk to you lovely let's do that tell me firstly a bit about your story so that we can establish context for listeners of course so i started to have body image issues i would say when i was about five years old i started primary school and i was just acutely aware that i looked a bit different um i'm from a predominantly white area. I was one of the only brown kids in my class and I thought I was bigger. I thought I was too much, basically instantly. And that developed over the next few years into this slight obsession with food. And I caught on very quickly that dieting was a thing and you know, my mum was doing it, the other kids' mums were doing it. Maybe if I did it too, I wouldn't feel so unruly in my body. I wouldn't feel like I was too much. And I started seriously dieting by the time I was about 10 years old. So that spiraled pretty quickly into disordered eating. And when I was 14, I was diagnosed with anorexia nervosa. That was a couple of years of kind of battling with my everything I had to get out of that. And even after I was out of that, I was still obsessed with losing weight. I still really, really believed and have believed for the majority of my life that thinness is the answer to happiness. And if I could just acquire it, everything would be okay. My life would be perfect. So I spent up until I was 21 chasing thinness, basically, until I discovered this thing called body positivity and that, and that changed my entire outlook. So that's, that's the backstory. What is body positivity? So I would say that it is a movement that believes that all bodies are worthy of respect, are good enough, and that nobody deserves to go through life feeling shit about themselves. Can I swear? Yes. Feeling shit about themselves because of the way they look in any capacity, whether that is size, shape, skin colour, age, gender, ability, anything, nobody should feel like they are worth any less because of their body. Body positivity then must to a degree be a response to the assumed beauty standards that we are not subtly um, kind of continually ubiquitously fed like I, and up until quite recently i i recognize now i do know a bit about body positivity because of like tess halliday and like different types of beauty but uh i you know like i didn't uh that's not like i never felt that was a as a personal taste issue that was never my personal standard of beauty when mm. regarding in regard to like as a heterosexual single person that was never my taste preference anyway but I recognise that there is a, a standard being held up. Yes, absolutely. And it's so, um, it's one of those things that you don't really see it until you are told that it's, you know, this is this is a problem. This is everywhere. You know, it's so, uh, as you said, just, just all consuming. It's, it's in all the media we look at. It's we turn on our phones, it's there. We turn on our TVs, it's there. And, and billboards and, and magazines and everywhere is this kind of, very very narrow image of this is beauty and the kind of subtext to that of beauty is happiness oh yes yes beauty is happiness beauty is contentment and for a, a large part of your life you felt that thinness mm. equals happiness that's a very curious belief now i've got friends uh with anorexia and I, because of my messianic complex, like, and because of my own experiences with drug addiction and eating disorders mm -hmm. to a less extreme degree, I felt like that the things that work around drugs and alcohol would be applicable with eating disorders. 
I found that it's extremely complicated in a way that's sort of difficult to anticipate. What's going on? I, I, like people with anorexia, for example, seem so lucid and capable of talking about it, and like, as if, oh my god, you completely understand the entire situation, and then they won't have something to eat after the conversation. What is going mm. on? Can you explain it to me as a person who's been on the inside? What is going on with anorexia? Um, I, I can give you my experience. Obviously, yeah. I, I would be wary in saying I'm not a medical professional, so I can only speak for myself, really. Um, so for me, it was a combination of a lot of things. I think three main things. First of all, being how my brain works, who I am inside my head. So I am have always been a perfectionist, have always been all or nothing, have always believed that nothing I do is is good enough for, for anyone or anything. Then the second thing that I think contributed to it is what we've already talked a little bit about, the culture, the kind of socio-cultural reasons. So we are in a culture that is ideal to, for contributing towards eating disorders. I um, I always think if the world had kind of been created by this large round table of people and they were sitting around and saying, OK, what can we put in the world that would really contribute to eating disorders? they would come up with this world where diet culture is everywhere and thinness is praised as the best thing a person can be. And we always are talking about it and always are thinking about it. This world is just ideal for eating disorders to, to blossom. Um, so psychological, who I am inside, sociocultural, going on around us. And I think the third thing, the third thing with anorexia, restrictive eating disorders, probably all eating disorders, that people don't realize is they are very self-perpetuating in that the the physiological effects that you get from starvation, essentially the kind of the high of control and the peacefulness that can come from what happens in your brain when, when you realize you can deny your basic instincts and you feel invincible. It, it almost gives you that feeling of you are indestructible. And for me, it was also, I can stop time. You know, I c if I am so in this, the world kind of stops spinning. You know, nothing else matters except the numbers that are going in and the numbers that are coming out. And that makes everything feel a little more in control for me. That's a really um, fascinating insight. The social cultural versus personal, I understand from other aspects of addiction. Do you think that you can put eating disorders under an umbrella heading of addiction or do you think it's separate? Uh, I don't really think I have like the authority to decide that, but I would lean towards separate. Hmm. I'm always sat claiming all sorts <laughs> of authority and all sorts of, I would, I'm thinking just go, yeah. <laughs> With my authority granted to me by this hat, I declare that eating disorders is under an umbrella heading of addiction. Um, so, like, you know, because with, uh, say, substance misuse, uh, gambling, even sex addiction, I feel like there are social cultural conditions that promote say promiscuity mm -hmm. and then if you have a sort of psychology that's very very needy and you want approval all the time then those two things are going to find a way of sort of marrying and you know sort of binding you to those kind of behaviors and i also think like uh, to continue one of the ideas you talked about in that in saying that this is a world almost perfectly contrived to create eating disorders, I feel that sort of other negative aspects of our nature are heightened, such as greed, such as selfishness. It's almost like we have systemized the lowest aspects of our complex and diverse natures. We have systemized the least pleasant aspects, or some of at least. Because mm, they make money, honey. So you think that ultimately, like uh, eating disorders, it, like it comes, it's a sort of a, what would you say, a capitalist or a consumerist issue? I wouldn't say that about eating disorders. I think I would say that about general body dissatisfaction. I think, you know, there's there's a big difference in what I talk about. I talk about diet culture and I talk about dieting. And I think it's really, really important to always point out that eating disorders are a different beast. They are really a step beyond body dissatisfaction or just you know a diet that's gone a bit too far um and i think capitalism has a lot of blame to hold in how we feel about ourselves and how we feel about our bodies mm. uh, i think in the last hundred years or so the the way that we've been sold thinness and diet products endlessly takes the brunt of how we feel about ourselves and in particular how how women feel about themselves but also now more so all genders why do you think 
it, um, you know, you're saying it's shifting now, but why do you think in particular women have been subject to these standards? What is it about our consumerist systems that mean that women have been particularly vulnerable or persecuted by, by this mentality or this ideology? Well, to put it simply, uh, advertisers all used to be men. <laughs> um, so I... I did a lot of research when I was book writing about the origins of how we feel about our body and kind of traced it back to about 100 years ago when it was advertisers who wanted a product that they could endlessly sell. They wanted to kind of hit upon the issue or the problem that they could sell the solution to forever. And women's bodies became an ideal problem to to put forward and it didn't affect them you know they could go about their lives but women were getting more and more money of their own to spend and you know you don't want women having too much free time you don't know what they get up to so telling them that their body is a problem that they should be spending their time and money and energy fixing oh. so lucrative so well it's just perfect it's it's, it's genius it is it's genuinely genius problemized female anatomy that's brilliant i understand yeah. i understand i have two things i want to say one is that um from what my wife believes and what a lot of people in sort of like hypno birthing and natural birth type ideologies believe that um childbirth has become medicalized and there's no doubt that there's certain situations where a medical establishment is definitely helps in childbirth situations but it's it philosophically it means a shift in power from a sort of female oriented systems to male oriented systems so like i like that i like the corollary that if you pro like problemize childbirth you're problemizing mm -hmm. femininity an important aspect of womanhood and the same with um, turning the female body into a conundrum of problem that needs to be resolved that continually needs to be managed in order to perpetuate consumerism and the general idea that if people are full of fear and desire and inadequacy they make better consumers that, exactly that, that exactly that and and i don't know when i was first coming into these ideas you'd, it's very easy to kind of say well that's a bit of a conspiracy theory you know that's let's let's not take it that seriously um but one example i i use regularly to really point this out is cellulite so cellulite is something that lots and lots and lots and lots of people have ne basically nearly every woman has cellulite and before 1972, it wasn't really seen as a flaw. It was a variation of flesh. It was pretty normal. And then in 1972, a woman called Nicole Ronsard, she owned a beauty salon in New York and she started selling procedures to get rid of cellulite. She wrote a book about getting rid of cellulite and she was featured in Vogue in America. So she wrote in Vogue that cellulite is a disfiguring attribute. And as soon as that issue hit stands, women across the whole of America suddenly had it cemented in their mind that these little lumps and bumps on their on their legs or wherever were hideous disfiguring flaws and this woman nicole she became a millionaire so <laughs> you know it it works that was a successful technique yeah i suppose we all have sort of latent feelings of inadequacy um and if you can find ways of commodifying that feeling then there is money to be made i i've like so i don't know where i've fit on the spectrum of it but like prior to becoming a drug addict i like uh, and when i talk to other addicts about um, drug addiction and other forms of addiction i said when i was a kid like i was very obsessive about food it meant a lot to me i ritualized the eating of chocolate i felt shame around it i did it in secret i used to eat like lots and lots of chocolate and then make myself sick this kicked in sort of around sort of 14 uh, 15 I, I was overweight then I didn't like my body I felt ashamed of my body did it for a, like a little while lost loads of weight and then you know got addicted to sort of drugs first recreational and then you know like a leaflet from the government worse and worse drugs and then like um when I stopped taking drugs again at 27 I like while I was in treatment started to eat and purge again and I didn't even really sort of notice it happen that's why I suppose I have that idea that there's a connection just because for me personally those behaviors seem connected that doesn't necessarily mean obviously i'm not a case i'm a, not a whole demographic am i i can't see myself as like a nation but i do like but a lot of other addicts that i've spoken to when you take drugs out of the way their food issues appear their sex issues appear gambling mm -hmm. you know it's obviously like behavioral addictions start to but like you know i, I but what i 
do not query is that there seems to be a threshold of eating disorders where people are in some territory that I think I don't know what that is you know it seems so extreme so unmanageable sort of like some frightening prism that I can't begin to get a handle on um but like with my own stuff with like their eating it was um I feel like why, why was I doing it? It was sort of like I like you know, needed. I wanted the comfort of food. I didn't feel good about my body. I felt sort of like ashamed. So you know, like you say now, increasingly like, uh, and I still to this day like there's always things like oh, I'd like to change that about my body. I'm aware of an ideal that I'm sort of trying to aspire to. That narrative still exists in my life. I'm not eating chocolate at the moment or like sugary food. God, I love chocolate. How I miss it, like cold from the fridge and stuff. Oh man. Anyway, I've taken it out of the equation for a little while. So I've always had a relationship with food that's had oddness in it, I think. Yeah. Yeah. You think that's more common with men these days? Um, I think, I mean, I think there are specific kind of issues that come up for for every gender and I think men especially now definitely aren't immune because there is a lot more you know the kind of men's health magazine cover ideal is around and and being fucked up around food I don't think that has a gender uh, I think that is getting to all of us I think we are all being taught very disordered ways of eating I think we're all being taught to not trust our bodies and our needs um, I think like in terms of, of your experience, I'm, I'm not generally a fan of like telling people that their uh, lived experience is incorrect. So I would never be like, that's not what that is. Um, I think if if people feel that they have addiction issues with food, then they can classify it that way. And if that helps them, especially to say that they're in recovery from that, then you do you. Um, I think for a lot of people, we feel out of control around food, maybe because we are not, it's... We are not addicts. We have just been taught extremely messed up things around food and eating. And I, for a lot of people that I've encountered, they have felt that they have had addictions to food and they have no control over food, but they've also been dieting for their entire life. I think that's a different, that's a different experience. If you've spent your entire life listening to all these outside rules about what you should and shouldn't eat and ignoring your own cues and hating your body, of course you are going to feel out of control around food when you're not on a diet that's that's a very natural thing that's you know that has that has root in our in our brains we are kind of trained to when we are experiencing starvation as soon as we get to food eat as much of it as possible because our bodies they st- they've evolved to still think that we're in a time of famine from from way back yonder so that is natural i think there are so there are so many categories of of disordered eating around food and i don't know i don't even know how i came to that but i just wanted to say it yeah and i think that sort of part of the solution must be the the educational problems you know deep psychological and personal uh journeys around trauma by their nature will have to be resolved individually though i'm sure there are you know techniques and systems that can be used with more than one person you know even with addicts so you know substance misuse addicts you find incredible variety but you also find incredible consistency to the point where there are certain systems that i believe will work for all substance misusers and but but when you were talking then about like, you know, we feel like it's been, we've been educated incorrectly about bodies and about food. And so no wonder that in conjunction with evolutionary psychology would create, you know, sort of control issues around food. Um, it made me think that sort of addiction is widely regarded to be a response to the denial of appropriate spiritual connection, mm-hmm. a result of living in within systems that deny human beings necessary access to community to love that that we live according to false ideals we mm-hmm. live in a materialistic society that has false ideals that are not coherent or to, with the way that we feel inside and in order to live within those systems we have to kind of even numb aspects of ourselves we have to escape aspects of ourselves we have to sort of prevent that awareness from growing and my again my personal experience has been that as i that, that my own addiction was a spiritual issue i felt empty i felt denied something and as i've addressed it as i've addressed the problem spiritually the problem has become more manageable i still feel the feelings worthlessness inadequacy pain the kind of things that addicts always feel 
Mm. But the like the solution is no longer substance misuse or or the other behaviours that were affiliated with that problem. Right, it's the opposite of addiction is connection. The opposite of addiction is connection. That generally, like one of the accepted maxims, mm. is is that yeah, and like that sort of that the sort of foundational myth around twelve step fellowships is that you know like you need a spiritual experience and you need community around you to help you to sustain it. Do you think that uh, that to spirituality uh, that, that there is that there is a spiritual aspect to solving or living with? Uh, what do you want to call it again? Body... Body image issues? Yes. Do you think that there's a spiritual component to resolving it? Um, for me, there was definitely a community component. Mm. Um, I don't know. It's, it's hard to pin down what a spiritual thing is, isn't it? It could be li- literally basically anything. Um, but for me, I did not feel able to really face that that deep pain and and heal from it without a group of people at least who were understanding me. So I um I stumbled into this online space where people were talking about body image and eating disorders and recovery and that was the first time in my life that I had ever felt heard. Uh and it was a complete accident. I was literally on the internet looking for for thin beautiful women in bikinis that I wanted to look like. And instead I found a fat woman in a bikini saying I'm fat and I'm fine with it. Um, and that is what opened everything up. That that feeling of, wow, I'm not going through this alone. This is, this is bigger than me. I think that's what so many people don't realize. And that's where so much of the shame comes from, I think, of body image issues. We think this is, on, this is all on me. This is completely my fault. I'm the one who's responsible for feeling this way because I'm imperfect. When actually it's so much bigger than us individually, you know, it is, it's being done to us and there are hordes of us who are feeling it. And if you find those people who are also feeling it and trying to heal from it, that's incredibly powerful. I don't know if that answers the question about spirituality. Certainly it answers the question about community that's collectively there's a way of confronting situations that individually seem insurmountable. I, I like what you said about how that's an an antidote to feelings of shame that knowing that other people are suffering in the same way as you that sort of does bring light to some of the lonelier aspects of our being um megan what about uh more contemporary examples of how body image issues are exploited and commodified what's uh, your opinion with eg avon and uh weight watchers stuff so Avon basically about I don't know when this is going to air. Avon recently came out with a campaign God, that you're a was professional. <laughs> um, that was very good. We can put this out at any point. <laughs> People will always understand Avon, and the concept of recent is a relative one. Thanks. Thanks, I feel good now. Um, So Avon recently came out with a campaign that was selling cellulite reducing creams and products. And along with the advert, they had the slogan, everybody is beautiful. Um, Which obviously (laughs) feels a bit strange. It feels like a bit of a disconnect. Everybody is beautiful. Unless you have cellulite, buy this product. It will take away your cellulite. Um, And that sparked a lot of online debate, a lot of posts about it. Jamila Jamil... Uh, came forward she's been very outspoken this year about diet culture and body image and I'm, I'm here for it I love it uh, and there was enough of a backlash that they took the advertising down and said they weren't going to run with it still selling the products um, but they they changed the advertising so my feelings about that are first of all we are very powerful when we kind of stand up and, and call something out uh, and we can affect change that is wonderful and I think it's also an example of how sneaky diet culture can be because on the surface you're gonna think it's harmless unless unless you've really thought about these things unless you have been taught to recognize that you're just gonna think oh that's nice my body's beautiful yeah i'll I'll give a go with that cream and get rid of my cellulite fine um and that's what they're they're counting on they they are very subtle these days diet companies and all kinds of companies when they're selling us things that rely on us feeling not good enough they are very subtle they are very clever mm. it was it was ages ago it was back in kind of the the 90s that all the big big diet companies like your weight watchers and your slimming worlds and your jenny craigs in america that's when they stopped calling themselves diets because it was kind of becoming common knowledge that crash dieting didn't work they didn't want to be associated with diets 
So they start calling themselves lifestyle changes. Um, I don't know if you've ever done one of those, but I I have, and it's it's drummed into you on the first session. This is not a diet. This is a lifestyle change. But it feels a lot like a diet when you can't eat cheese. Um, <laughs> so that <laughs> this is a lifestyle change. A lifestyle where you don't eat cheese. Yeah. See you next week when you won't have had any cheese. You better have lost some bloody weight and all yeah. on this lifestyle change. That'll be five pounds. Ah! <laughs> the chair just went. <laughs> I feel more she powerful, still though. laughed even though it's retrospective do you feel more powerful <laughs> how much bad. power do you need woman <laughs> I'll stay down here I'm quite happy <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Megan when did you first decide <laughs> yeah well I sneaky, like that sneaky, it yeah. is sneaky and crafty of uh of uh avon in that mm. particular case to use sort of contradictory language but in a sense that's just like a revelation of something that we know that companies will say whatever's necessary to market their pro- product mm. and the concealment of hypocrisy is stitched deeply into them almost any like i mean it sort of it makes me weary really any brand that you can look at will at some point like you think, oh god because like the, because this it runs pretty deep these systems require exploitation of both the consumer and the people that ge- generally manufacture the products you know or or the earth itself it's so you know even dear old avon which for me was just a lady with a, a sort of a tray around her Aww. neck knocking on the door inoffensively as i recall I has know. now become tainted with hypocrisy and cruel paradox they have they they fucked they fucked up a little bit they really have and so and with the um the weight watchers i suppose again it's like the, it's just the, it's just, like it's just the response to oh well you can't call it diets now people don't like that yeah. lifestyle and do the same thing yeah right yeah weight watchers have, have gone one step further than calling it a lifestyle and they've changed their whole name um in the u.s i'm not sure if they've changed it here but they've changed it to wellness that works um wellness has become kind of a bit of a buzzword lately especially in the last year or so it's kind of the new clean eating you know like there's always like the trendy diet culture term uh something to do with goji berries or clean eating or now it's wellness like wellness is innocuous wellness sounds just kind of <laughs> It's natural. Like it's, it's. We all want to be well, and and it's very clever to play into that. Yeah. Not fooling me. Um. But people will, people will buy it. How do you? So what's you? How do you campaign against these things? Is it through sort of like awareness and through online stuff? And what is your feeling about what should replace it? What should replace well weight loss groups? I guess what should we... If the prevailing attitude is one that we should be aspiring to a particular ideal and um, that there's a commodification of the way we see ourselves, how do you feel that we can combat that now? Is a better way of framing that question. I think since the chair fell, I felt just less generally less authoritative. Would you like to raise it? I would a bit. <laughs> but like even that, I don't really fully know how to do that's how <laughs> that's how castrated i am in this moment okay the chair's shrunk me down to several inches below your eye line <laughs> and the chair it's the mechanic <laughs> of the chair itself is beyond me i will help you if you if you really need <laughs> i mean i think what's happened is I think there might be a leader that sort of pumps it up. <laughs> also, I'm slightly scared of what happens if it happens again. I think, do you know, I think I don't even think it was a fault, Jen. I think it was like I trod on the lever, and then, like I myself was the engineer of my own destruction, as is so often the case with me. <laughs> oh, hold on a minute. Wait a second. I'm reaching for the stars now. This is the most professional podcast I've ever done. <laughs> there was a bit where in his stocking foot, he pumped himself up. <laughs> right, so what should replace... Yeah, and how do we combat it? Like, you know, what what attitudes do we want to popularise among young people or any people that are feeling uh, body image issues? How do we do it? What do you feel is necessary? Well, the, I think part of the issue of, of what makes it so hard to pin down this is what we do is because it's always changing and it's always kind of morphing and becoming something else and slipping under our under our noses but in general i think we need cultural awareness about this we need this to be taught we need young people to know about this um we need diversity of body sizes to be completely normalized obviously we're getting a, a bit more of that now we're getting you know a few more magazine covers like t- like test holidays we're getting a few more uh, brands who aren't photoshopping things anymore that that's all well and good 
But if you turn on the TV to to a, a sitcom or, you know, a, any kind of regular channel, 95% of the people you see are still going to look the same. So diversity is What's good. What's ordering this? What's maintaining this system? How can it ever really be challenged? I see what you mean, that if there is more awareness of diversity, but part of me feels that all that will happen... And I did think this a little bit with uh, Tess Holiday, is it Holiday or Halliday? Holiday. Tess Holiday, who like we did, a, we talked about that online and stuff. And you know, but like, I, I think I said at the time, in a sense, it's just another commodification of a woman's body because changing social trends mean that this is monetizable currently. Do how do you feel about that? Um, like that, the lens through which we receive what's acceptable is. This commodified. Yeah, yeah. So I think I think there definitely are people who kind of say in general body positivity is talking about the wrong thing because we're still talking about bodies. Is that kind of the the gist? You know, we are still focusing on on the physical and, and maybe actually the answer is to not focus on that at all and go beyond it. Um I've had people say that to me before. And I think my response to that generally is we still exist in bodies. We still are in a culture that is obsessed with bodies. And for me, I I could not have gone from a lifetime of hating everything about myself physically to just not caring at all. You know, I kind of needed, it's almost like I needed the stepping stone of feeling positive about my appearance to then go and live my life and not care as much. Um, so... There will always be an issue. And when it comes to magazines and, and things like that, they're never going to be perfect. Some people say we should just destroy that altogether and not buy into them. Other people say we should change them from the inside. Um, it's incredibly complicated, but I, I, I think we should be seeing it more as stepping stones towards an end goal. And for me personally, the end goal of what I do is generally I just want people to feel less shit about themselves and less fucked up around food so they can do important things like live their lives and know that they are about more than than all of this and, and there's more to be done and think about and believe in, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so stepping stones on the way to there. Yeah, that's a clear intention. That makes sense. And that um, uh, it elides into what I believe that the end point is to think about ways of alleviating suffering do you still feel connected to the person that felt that n negativity about herself is that something you feel still what is your relationship with that now i i think there's a bit of a misconception that if you believe in body positivity or you promote positive body image you feel flawless all the time and you've you know you forget that you've ever hated yourself i don't think that's true at all no. um i think it's fine to, to feel neutral about yourself most days rather than anything positive uh for me i feel connected to that version of myself in so much as i really viscerally feel how she deserved better she is kind of my one of my motivations now of you know, it's, it's a bit cheesy now because it's been overdone online a bit but be the person you needed when you were younger kind kind of thing um so i feel that way about her and actually one of the first things i i always tell people if you are really struggling to even consider that you deserve to feel good about yourself think about the first time you were ever made to feel bad about yourself did that version of you deserve better most of the time that version is a child and of course no child deserves to feel like they are too much or like their body is wrong or like they're hideous because of how they look of course you deserve better you still do so she is i'm connected with her because because she's why i'm doing this that's lovely what were your reference points do you think when you were five years old and first began to feel uncomfortable what do you think what do you think that was i would say well you have limited, I suppose, exposure when you're younger, but I was very into stealing my mum's magazines. Um, I was very into Disney, the classic things that a five-year-old girl is into. All right, so you think that even at that point, you think it's cultural influences. Like, what about familial influence? Do you think that you're, did, did you, were both your parents around and did you have, like, love coming at you from all angles? 
I I I did. Um, my my parents are wonderful, wonderful people, and never intentionally instilled in me that that my body was wrong. Um, I have an older brother. He used to tease me a bit, but older brothers do that. Right. Uh, and. For me, I think even for parents, even if you are not consciously telling your child that their body is wrong, how you are talking about your body, that that is their greatest reference point, really, because that's in their home. That's what they're hearing all the time. And, you know, I um, I sometimes talk to groups of, of mothers who are thinking, how can I avoid my child feeling the way that I have felt and the way that I still feel about my body. Um, and, I, and I always want to kind of tell them it, first of all, you know, don't blame yourself. It's not your fault. You exist in this culture. That's why you feel this way. You're not a bad person, but it does count how you speak about your own body, whether you are counting calories in front of your kid, whether you're standing in front of the mirror and pulling at parts of your body as if they're not attached to you, uh, they are going to pick that up. Right. God, that's really important. So, yeah, I see. Put your own uh, mask on first, as they say on airplanes. <laughs> yeah, and um and I've even I've even spoken to people who kind of fake it that way and until they make it, you know, if they um if they don't believe that they deserve to do it for themselves, they they definitely deserve to do it for their for their kids so they can kind of fake a positive body image in front of the kids. Maybe it'll start to wear off a little bit. Not ideal, but a starting point for some people. For my so my children then, right, so me and their mum, we've got to be confident and not like me, like going, oh, I could do with losing a few pounds, <laughs> drably standing in front of a reflection. <laughs> that's good. All right, that's a good tool to recall. That it, How can you transmit something that you don't have? How can you transmit to your children that you are beautiful and you have everything you need unless you afford that to yourself because i suppose holistically we're only separated by 20 30 in my case 40 years from the next generation they say god has no grandchildren mean, meaning that we all have our own connection to the infinite and that we are worthy of that love ourselves that we would afford to our own children and children generally um what about this nhs calorie counting thing for kids what does that mean then megan mm. um this came out a little while ago so it's a why are you, why are you grinning i'm grinning because i think like <laughs> i see you get all professional that's why i see you know i feel like oh what this woman is about is like she, right like you're a crusader aren't you I You're a crusader. So. You're like, no, nope, that's got to be stamped out. <laughs> that's a good thing, isn't it? Yeah, maybe a little bit. <laughs> because I suppose like one of the things when you think of the sort of uh, general sense about how society has been organised for in sort of post-industrial and perhaps post-colonial world, that there's not been enough uh, diverse voices, enough female voices, you're good at conveying your voice and you have opinions. I, I think, well, that's good because this person's going to right some wrongs, redress the balance. Thank you very much. Um, so the NHS, they, uh, I'm sure with with semi-good intentions, have released a campaign aimed at children, encouraging them to only have two snacks a day under 100 calories. They have a, a several adverts kind of churning this out. They even have a very, very catchy theme tune. Um, do you want me to sing it for yes, you? Yes, please. I'd love a catchy <laughs> theme tune. It goes, look for 100 calorie snacks, two a day max. <laughs> Look for a hundred calories next, two a day max. But like, so yeah. what? You think that's encouraging children oh, to? Oh, that. Well, I mean, that got into my head after listening to it once. Um, so as a kid, that would get that would get stuck in there. Um, and you know, obviously, their intentions are to get kids eating more healthily. Um, but for me personally, I believe that calorie counting teaching children to see food as numbers isn't necessarily the best way to do that. I I believe more in teaching children to value food for how it makes their bodies feel. Does it make you energized? Does it make you a bit sluggish? Um, how do you feel the next day after you have this or this? That's a great and not kind of branding anything as bad. Sorry, is that weird when people use your last name as a as a verb. Yeah. No, I can do I can live with it. Okay. Not branding anything as as bad or sinful or any kind of moral judgment because every time we kind of put food into a moral category of good or bad, we unconsciously translate that to ourselves. We are good or bad when we eat it. And I just don't think kids should be feeling like they are good or bad as people, depending on what they eat. I mean, it's it's great to encourage them to see nutritious food in a positive light. 
I don't think that is calorie counting, especially as someone who latched onto calories so, so early and had her whole mind taken over by numbers. Right, there's a lack of awareness, isn't there? There's a lack of awareness, because like you said, it's likely a well-intentioned program with uh, 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 an appealing jingle. But the if they'd consulted people that understood more, then it would likely be more appropriate. Yes, and, the, and and there was a right. backlash, especially in the recovery community online. There's quite a strong uh, eating disorder recovery community as well on Instagram. And they um, did posts about it. They made videos about it. They had people on the news saying, this is hurting people. This is hurting me. You know, it's it's triggered me and for this person in their recovery. Uh, they haven't changed it. <laughs> so... <laughs> nah, let's <laughs> ignore that. That's interesting. Because my other, one, like, more broad beliefs is that... Uh, you, when you're suffering from something, you need someone that's overcome it or to help you. It, it can be alienating to deal with a, a sort of a professional that seems like they don't have personal experience. But that, again, I suppose is because I'm so embedded in recovery for addiction. It's the lens through which I live my life now, as a matter of fact. Because I was so obsessive as an addict, that sort of that, obsessi- that obsessiveness has ha- had to become awareness in recovery, awareness of the way that I think, awareness of the way that I try to resolve my, you know, problems, how I identify my feelings as as opposed to just accepting them. And I think that it would be difficult for me to take guidance from people that like that, uh, that where their information is data derived as opposed to empirically lived like you know when i see people that were worse drug addicts than me they've got themselves together like i can listen to them yeah yeah and i suppose in a, in a very simple sense that's also what i want to do for people and, and kind of be like there is a recovery that is really I mean, I believe in recovered. Um, a lot of people don't. And I, and a lot of people in eating disorder recovery do liken it to addiction recovery and in that you're always kind of recovering, which I think is fine and I think it's valid. And I think if that helps, do that. Um, I believe in recovered because I don't I don't feel like the same person as, as, as the one who had an eating disorder. What systems do you employ now that you didn't have access to then when you see like you know you were saved you were looking on the internet for thin women in bikinis you found as you said a fat woman in a bikini and that sort of became a pivotal moment for you what how what can you implement what do you use in your personal journey to prevent the old attitudes prevailing hmm i am at first, I think I just used anger. <laughs> um, it's not a te- not a technical program. Who's the anger at? <laughs> um, I th- well, it's kind of it's an anger that I had spent a very long time directing inwards uh, to myself for not being good enough. And as soon as I started learning about diet culture and uh, and about all these reasons why we feel the way we do about our bodies, I very quickly started to pivot that anger at all of these forces that are in play that make us feel the way we do about our bodies and and get angry for five-year-old me who shouldn't have been hating her body and get angry at all these companies that keep selling us cellulite reducing creams etc and for me that was very very helpful to Mm. know that i shouldn't be getting the blame i shouldn't be getting my own anger it belongs somewhere else um and and especially Especially as a woman, I'd kind of also spent a lifetime believing that anger was not not an, an attractive emotion for a lady. Uh, it's not a very ladylike thing, anger. So you should just, you know, squash that down and hide your feelings. So letting that out is is liberating. It's it's I think it's good good for people sometimes. Um, so I used that, and I used a lot of kind of self edu not self education, educating myself through the work of other people. So. The, the first book I read when I came into this was The Beauty Myth by Naomi Wolf. And it's this kind of iconic like manifesto from the 90s about advertising and about beauty ideals and eating disorders and just like laying it all out. And I started finding more and more books like that. There are books like that on health, um, Health at Every Size by Linda Bacon and Losing It by Laura Fraser, which is, Losing It by Laura Fraser, which is about the diet industry. Um, and I kept finding all these kind of outside sources of this information that made me see that 
it wasn't an individual thing, yeah. that there's actual facts, there's actual empirical evidence here that this is being done to us. So I keep myself quite immersed in that. Now, I have, um, I have Instagram, a lot of people make fun of this term, I like it. I have Instagram as a bit of a safe space. Um, so my entire feed is filled with people who aren't dieting, with people who are celebrating diversity and talking about self-acceptance and self-care and mental health awareness. So I know that I always have a place to go back to, even if I go through my day being kind of bombarded with all these messages that I'm wrong and my body is wrong and I should change it, I can actually go on my phone and find a whole line of things that say the opposite. So that for me has been a, a good tool for all its negatives. It has a lot of positives for me. So you can, and anyone can, curate your social media profile so that it's a sort of positive and affirmative thing rather than, you bastard, I'll kill you. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's it's it seems like such a simple thing that people don't take it seriously. Um, but what we are seeing every day is having a huge effect on how we are seeing ourselves. It's becoming the lens of, of through which we see ourselves. And... Um, can I be a bore and, and mention a study? I can't imagine how you would ever be a bore, but please. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so one of the most kind of um, well-known studies about uh, imagery and how it affects us was done in the 90s by a woman called Anne Becker. And it was, she she went to Fiji in 1995 and there had been no TV. The, the girls in Fiji had not seen beauty ideals. Um, they had not seen... Well, they didn't have TV. Um, and then they introduced it if, if, uh, and they brought in shows from the UK and the US and New Zealand. And within, I think it was three years, 74% uh, of these girls said that they felt like they were too fat. And before that, the beauty ideal in Fiji had been strong, robust. Um, they encouraged feasting. They, they loved a thick gal. Uh, and then all of a sudden, 74% of girls thought that they were too fat and 15% and were uh, bulimic in three years. So I think that, I'm, <laughs> I mention that because it's such a perfect snapshot. We can't do it again because like nearly everyone's got TV now. Um, it's such a perfect snapshot of, <laughs> snapshot of how what we are seeing is affecting how we are seeing ourselves. So Instagram, absolutely you should be curating your feed. You should be on a regular basis going through and thinking, is this making me feel shit about myself? If the answer is yes, why is it there? Yeah, we've got some ability to cultivate and eliminate things that are negative. But I suppose it's easy to habitualize negative messages to the self, isn't it? To yourself, you know, we use it culturally that feels like that's what's normal and whilst you know say when i think about say like ho hollywood films and people being beautiful you feel like oh no you know that's cool because i like things to be glamorous but we are sort of unaware of how deeply we've been programmed when it comes to what we regard as beautiful what we regard as acceptable and the secondary effects of ubiquitous ideals being broadcast to us that we sort of feel that we can't live up to it's very interesting that it <laughs> makes sense to me like and i think obviously it goes like it's excellent that you're so well versed in the particular area of a uh, body image and body positivity but i think about it in terms of identity like this is what a man is like that's because you know mm. like, because my journey differs from yours on like, in, in many ways uh, like you know that where i've found the the facets for self punishment where oh, i'm not good enough at this this is what i should be like as a man these are the things i should be fulfilling you know but like it's I suppose it's good to have aspiration, but uh, aspiration and ideals to head towards. But I suppose what has happened is we have limited those ideals, we have commodified those ideals, and we are selling people ideals that de determine that uh, people feel miserable and worthless in their point of participation with their culture. Yeah, and I think there's um, there's something there's there's really something in that about having a sense of purpose and um you know there are there are some people who have also written whole books about how this obsession with our bodies and and particular thinness is kind of replacing religion a little bit and there has lots of kind of religious connotations in it you know we've we've sinned uh we wow. have our idols um we repent you know we are chased there's there's a lot like of this 
<laughs> there's a lot of that in in diet culture and i think even fasting and earlier you said there was a sort of a euphoria to mm-hmm. the, the fasting and a sort of a sense of connection because like one of my uh, underlying beliefs and i'm sorry if you've not entirely finished your point is that all of the problems in uh, not all but, but yeah no all all the problems in society is because we've lost our connection to mm-hmm. a, a, a deep truth like ideas of oneness of innate beauty of uh, that our function is communal and collective to love one another that these ideas are so sort of lost and swamped in individualistic consumerist materialistic ideas that we got no connection to them so we have to fortify and um, falsify these ideas wherever we can or anything that emulates and mimics and mirrors them we cling to because it somehow resonates with us on a level that we can't even quite remember because our culture hasn't acknowledged those principles for so long yes um <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I would agree. And and personally, I got extremely wrapped up in um, in my purpose being to fit the to fit the beauty standard because I didn't know what else my purpose was, um, and I didn't know kind of what what I was supposed to be doing here. So I thought, well, beautiful is the best thing that I can be. It's the best thing that I can be for other people, and that also ties in with the kind of objectification issue of of um, women being taught that they are just here to please others and be visually appealing to others. Uh, we are definitely we are definitely lacking uh, a deeper sense of of what our purpose is. And and I, I'm not an expert or a prophet. I don't really know what that is, but I know it's not to look like a Kardashian because they already they already exist you don't need to be one of them yes yes idolatry though as you said is like an aspect of spirituality or religion that we're sort of unconsciously emulating talk to me a bit more about uh objectification and where you think that fits into this please well um i i guess i got the message very young that um how attractive I was to other people, what other people thought about my body uh, was something to value quite highly, um, something to put validation in. And to be completely honest with you, even having been immersed in this body positive stuff now for five years, that still gets to me sometimes. I, I still get a, a get caught up in um, what does this person think about how I look? Not to the point that I did. I, you know, I had a point where I literally wouldn't answer my front door um, if I wasn't, you know, all, all made up and glam. I wouldn't even answer the door to the postman because I didn't want him to look at me because I thought I was too unattractive. But that kind of message that we give, especially to girls, that their appearance is number one um, and who they are on the inside is is often secondary. And I think that is shifting a little bit because we're getting more we're getting more media aimed at young girls that is about being powerful or strong or having having goals outside their appearance rather than you look very pretty in with the pink bow in your hair um and that's good but it was very strong in me and i'm still unlearning it it is so so deeply conditioned yeah i think i have that a bit how do you how do you undo that oh lord um i personally I like to remind myself very often that I have more important things to do than uh, being attractive to other people and it's, it's not it's not always easy to believe but I cannot I cannot buy into a message anymore that tells me that how physically appealing I am to others is the number one reason I'm here. You know, it, it can't be, I'm not a thing, you know, I'm not, mm. I'm not an ornament. I'm not a lifeless painting hanging up in a museum. I am a, I'm a living, breathing, doing thing. And, you know, I kind of shifting my thinking of my body is not there to be looked at by others. It's there for me, it is my vehicle. It is Ooh. there to let me live and experience and, and see and do slightly problematic for people with varying various levels of ability but to some extent your body is is yours to experience the world in however you're able to do that um and again it slips all the time it slips all the time um but i try to hold on to it i see that i like that as well uh, when i say these things back to it so that i understand them better um ob- like the the objectification is a kind of tyranny i'd not thought of that aspect of objectification that you're teaching people that uh, you know in in your example women that the, the primary function is to be 
received it's difficult isn't it because we do and like you said it's an ongoing challenge for you because we do get you know like sort of biochemical rewards if people show us approval and you know like i've noticed my mood change i once had this amazing conversation with this uh theatre director about the meaninglessness of criticism and how you can't trust what's in media and it's all meaningless and they've got their own agenda and da 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 da, da. and while we were talking a text came through to him saying you've been nominated for this award by the evening standard like from, he was like yes <laughs> <laughs> like, you know and like it's <laughs> i identify with that because maybe that's why there's so much pain and anger in it because uh, we have been hurt in this way we have been these sort of institutions and the ideologies that they purvey have got into our deepest selves, our child selves. We know like uh, there's a sort of a very common psychiatric exercise where you're invited to sit with your child self or teenage self or whatever and, you know, love them and that. And I remember the first, well, not even the first time, it's not that long ago. I was like invited to do that by a therapist I was seeing and I like felt disgusted like no nah, i don't want to be near that kid mm. and like that's a sort of a demonstration of like a revulsion at the self that you can't live with that there has to be a harmony doesn't there there has to be uh you know integration and acceptance of yourself i like that you're so open about how hard you find it still to practice self-love and to let go of the need for other people's approval yeah um i think that is I mean, it's a complicated thing because it's by the very nature of what I do and existing on the internet also, um, I've kind of been dubbed an influencer. Ah, oh, an um, influencer. Yeah, I, I don't know how I feel about that. That's what, uh, that's what people call me. Um, and that, like it or not, is fairly image focused. Right. Um, so it's kind of that double-edged sword of, of I'm, I'm using social media to try and spread the message of you're more than your body, go out and do, you don't have to be obsessed, you don't have to hate yourself, um, you can do more, here's a picture of my face. So, it, um, <laughs> yeah, it, it doesn't always mesh perfectly. And also, I'm still living in this culture, you know, as much as I try and feed my brain with all this kind of counterculture, um, sometimes it is still it is still going to get to me, it's still going to get to everyone, even even the people who are spreading these messages of, of self-love and self-acceptance and body acceptance, they're still going to feel like shit sometimes. And that and that's that's normal. What was that post that you talked about where like a single post, I think you reposted it or created it, elicited sort of quite extreme uh, opposing responses? Um. So it was uh, a video of me. I do these videos, um, they're dancing videos, and they started years and years ago, essentially, as a celebrate your body as it moves, celebrate the jiggle, you know, don't hate the shake, that's what people call them. Um, and I was doing one with my sister, uh, and they unfortunately often become a commentary on, on my body and, and people's opinions of how it's changed. So within kind of 10 comments from each other, there was one comment saying, you're getting slimmer and slimmer. Clearly, you don't think that your fat is cute. And the kind of 10 comments down, there was a comment that said, you're getting fatter every day, yuck. Um, so it's that very polarizing views that whichever way you look at it, make still make me hyper-focus on my body. You know, I, I, I don't require people to tell me exactly what they think about my body, but by the nature of what I do, people do. And they, and they don't see the harm in that. Even within the world of, say, body positivity or, uh, say, feminist-driven ideas about womanhood, oppression of women, objectivity of women, is there conflict about how the the aims of equality or even, you know, I don't know, proper rights for expression, not necessarily even equality, that's because equality suggests that the standard has already been preset by the uh, dominant group. But like, you know, the, is, is there opposition about how that should be achieved and what's correct? Do you find, is there like- Oh my gosh, absolutely. I, 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 like online, um, in general, I think online activist spaces or, you know, things that you can call activism, are some of the most harshly critiqued spaces uh, with the most infighting and the most call out culture. Mm. Um, it's it's rife, it is it's everywhere, it's on everything that you post and say and do. Um, and, and personally, my brain is kind of always working 10 steps ahead of what, what other people are gonna say about this. 
I really don't want to offend anyone. I don't want to get anything wrong. But then also uh, I can't take, I can't learn. I can't make a mistake. Um, yeah, that, so that that's a lot. And yeah. um, in, in body positivity, there's there's definitely differing views of people. There's people who think I'm doing it completely wrong. And there's there's people who think I'm changing the world. So it's, that again is a very polarizing existence. It's kind of, it, it gives you um, quite a foggy sense of self to have these constant thousands of opinions about who you are at your core from people who don't know you and have never met you uh and and you get a bit lost sometimes i get a bit lost sometimes in that because that's fame actually i think you know whilst you're describing a particular type of fame like that fame is now you are subjected to the opinions of people who don't know you and sometimes they will tell you you're fantastic and there will be financial opportunity and opportunities to feel magnificent superficially briefly for a while before it all recedes into meaninglessness uh, but at other times there will be condemnation and attack and it's the same machine that does it and it's the machine does what the machine requires at that particular time and there is no morality behind it it's an amoral machine machine it doesn't care about anything except commerce and commodification and it will commercialize and commodify anything that comes in front of it like there are brands that will go right yeah this is popular now bang we'll sell that and like and we will compromise and say well at least now that message is getting out there but you know and and per perhaps that's the argument of progress you could say well at least, you know generally speaking we can say that there is an awareness now that it's not acceptable to use certain language it's acceptable like to you know i suppose i feel like in a sense like i was never subject to like that i was never in terms of you know i god obviously any man that's been a promiscuous man like I, I have to hold my hands up to objectification of women like because it but it's an unconscious it's tutored in the same way that attitudes toward food or drugs have been but i've never um sort of subscribed to like particular aspects of beauty myth around thinness and things like that i don't know perhaps that's just i don't, I don't know if that's got sort of any value or merit because there's certainly no question that that standard is held up reiterated and continually per perpetuated i wonder what it is in particular about you know because it's not like we're just trying to change the ideal is it it's like you're trying to say people who who people are is we should accept people for who they are I think um, to to the question of why that is held up, even when maybe it, it's it's not always the preferred um, body type for heterosexual men, uh, it's because it's the most profitable one. Um, I, I genuinely believe like thinness. Obviously, we've had varying degrees. We've had you know times where it's okay to be a bit curvier. We've had Marilyn Monroe, but then we've had Kate Moss, but then we've had the Kardashians, and it does it does come in waves. Um, but I think in general, it is always thinness because it's hard to achieve <laughs> because it is hard for the majority of us to be that. Even if uh, even if the men folk are saying that's not what they want, it is what's gonna make the most money it's what we're going to give our energy to uh and it just keeps going and going and going and going and then the beauty ideal changes into something else and that's how it stays so profitable um i think oh, i was going to say something else about that as well it was quite a long speech wasn't it? <laughs> it covered objectification mm. it covered commodification mm. there was a lot of vacations it was oh well, let's let's move on maybe it'll come back what do you think about like um like do you have now uh, yeah when i talked to you about program before like do you have a sort of a program and you, and you talked about ways of sort of connecting with a community uh giving yourself wide access to affirmative and positive messaging what about your relationship with food it, what's that so i believe very firmly in something called intuitive eating um it is essentially learning to listen to your body uh giving yourself permission to eat what your body wants and kind of getting back in touch with with that innate knowing of what your body needs we're we're all born with the ability to know when we are hungry and when we are full when we want to eat and when we want to stop and we lose it along the way because we're always being pummeled with all this messaging about good and bad uh and wrong and sinful etc about food so for me intuitive eating was throwing out all of the rules that I had been taught about food and learning to reconnect with, with my body and, and trust my body as well. So that means before sitting down for a meal, actually thinking, 
what am I craving? Not just in terms of what's going to taste good, but how is it going to make my body feel? Do I want something light? Do I want something heavy? Do, you know, it's it's kind of, it sounds really simple, but getting back in touch with, with your body. Um, and there are programs, there are actual proper programs, and you can find um, intuitive eating nutritionists who will kind of coach you through that process. I did it mainly through reading. It's probably not the ideal way, uh, but that's how I did it. And that was a long process as well um, with a lot of peaks and troughs because I had been placing these external restrictions on my diet for as long as I could remember. So obviously, as soon as I, I read this thing that was like, um, you should listen to your body and you should eat what you want when you want it. I was like, whoa, cookie dough, <laughs> endlessly. Um, and and then that's scary because then you think I'm out of control. I'm never gonna stop eating cookie dough. Uh, but it says next, trust that you will stop eating the the cookie dough the ice cream the forbidden you will you will eventually tire of the forbidden if you believe it's no longer forbidden if you um think i don't need to eat this endlessly because it's going to be there tomorrow if i want a bit um and and neutralizing just neutralizing all foods so that you genuinely yeah. you don't feel like a worse person if you eat ice cream or a better yeah. person if you eat a salad and that is deep yeah. that is like really deep work to do yeah. And it's a lot of trusting, trusting things that you kind of have no reason to trust. <laughs> because it's cyclical, isn't it? Like when you associate shame with your eating, then you, you, it's never ending because you have to find means to comfort and deal with that shame. Uh, I think it's amazing. I, like I just realized when you were talking then, like how <clears throat> serious like bulimia is, how serious anorexia is that I... You know, and I think it's great, and obviously your choice to use the word recovered, uh, like that. I don't talk to that many people, maybe because they don't bring it up or whatever. But like that, where I feel like they're on the other side of that, because when people are in it, I feel like it's a proper war zone. For uh, like, how, how did you get out of that? I mean, the mo the sort of extreme version of it. What's the way out? Because I, for even on a personal level, I know people right now. And, you know, as I'm sure everybody does, you know, and I feel, and I thought I could solve it with charisma. Turns out to be quite a blunt tool. <laughs> That's a very big question. Um, I, to be honest, I have never been able to put my finger on a kind of one size fits all. This is how you do it. Uh, um, I don't know why I would be able to do that. I'd be very arrogant to think that I could do that. Um, but f my, my recovery was jolted by kind of the same anger that I had mentioned previously. Freaking so um, yeah, the good old rage. I, um, I, I hit a rock bottom in my anorexia and it got to a point where I was just this destructive force to everyone around me and I was hurting everyone I loved and I had lost two years of my life and I wasn't in school and I'd, I'd lost my wow. friends um, and, and I was just destroying everything. And at How that point- How was your family? very very supportive but very lost of, in what to do um so my i i kind of always say that my dad really saved my life he he was my driving force in recovery he helped me more than any therapist ever did because he um he listened patiently non-judgmentally he went out of his way to learn about things he, yeah he's a good egg he's a good egg um and it was really it was him seeing him destroyed that kind of allowed me f for small fractures of time to tap into that anger of, I can't believe this illness has done this. Um, I, I, had to, I had to separate it from myself at that stage um, and see it as something that had kind of overtaken me, yeah. uh, that I could yeah. turn into an enemy that I could be angry at. So mm -hmm. a, a common thing is shout back at the eating disorder. You know, it becomes this voice in your head uh, it becomes just repetitive, constant, telling you what to do, telling you about yourself, governing everything you do. And shouting back at that is, is quite a common thing to use as a practical tool. And that did help me. And it was that anger of, I don't want this to take any more of my life. Um, I actually didn't deserve this and my family definitely didn't deserve this. No, no way am I doing this anymore. Uh, that that kind of fueled me into taking the first bites, I guess, um, the first meals. Um, and that was very hard, was it? Oh my gosh, it's, 
it's so it's so hard to explain i am um, i had a friend a couple of years ago who is in recovery she's doing much better now but she once said to me that it, it genuinely feels like every time you sit down for a meal someone puts their hand over your mouth it feels like there is an external person covering your mouth so you cannot eat it doesn't feel like a choice that is the thing that is what kind of separates um an eating disorder from just body image issues or dieting it doesn't feel like you have a choice anymore you do it's just buried it's really buried under the eating disorder um so that those first bites denying the sort of shouting back at the eating disorder that anger that propelled me and that that kept me going and that kind of allowed me to recover to an extent there's this very strange thing in um in the medical field generally is if you have a restrictive eating disorder that has uh made you lose a significant amount of weight as soon as you put weight back on they like to say that you've recovered <laughs> or at least that's what they did to me they were like well she's she doesn't fit the stereotypical image of anorexia anymore she's she's good she's all good um i wasn't of course because the physical is only such a small part of eating disorders there are mental illness it, it's it's all in, it's, you know it's in your head as well um so i didn't feel really recovered until all those years later when i found body positivity and the fat woman in the bikini um but do we know who the fat woman in the bikini is yes we do um she's one of my closest friends <laughs> now um she's a woman called danny uh, and she is a fat positive eating disorder recoverer i guess so so and mentor to you yeah she's and she's wonderful she's someone who has always been um she's always been fat so she is i don't know i think about a size 22 and she had a restrictive eating disorder but because of her size no one ever took it seriously she uh, wasn't diagnosed she didn't get the treatment she deserved um but she found her way out and that's that's an, that's another fucked up thing about our kind of conception of eating disorders as a culture that certain people are more worthy of treatment than others um and that it's because it it eating disorders have physical side effects that I think more so in terms of other mental illnesses people will judge just on that and that is not it's not how it should be judged you know absolutely everyone should get their treatment regardless of how they look mm, you should be a consultant for people that are <laughs> organizing the treatment that's really good data Maybe. that's really really good data that's yeah. really interesting that thing that you say and reiterated about the anger for me, this is uh, like again because I will force anything for a sort of a spiritual lens. Ultimately, it feels like a connection. Finally, I could like it's felt like the when I was listening to this because I'm trying to understand it. And think how can I utilize this in my own life? God forbid that I should ever have to. Uh, like that, your father help was able to hold it. I like that he listened and he didn't judge. That's pretty hard because i mm. think as a father you may be like right let's get on with this thing <laughs> and you know you want to be active i suppose and uh i like that 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 seemed to be inspirational to you and then that buried deep you said you found that choice and that anger which i reckon and like to think of as uh, a sort of a central spirit that we have that we lose connection with because we overly associate and connect with external stimuli and external conditioning to the point where we no longer value that connection the most important connection that we have mm. And when that's reactivated, it will give you what you need. In your case, uh, energy as anger. In the, the therapy that I have, uh, my therapist says, like, you know, that all these things we experience as negative, e.g. sadness. He says, sadness is healing. Uh, anger is motivating and energizing. And fear has wisdom in it. Those are the three that I remember. That, that fear has awareness and wisdom in it. Because these are things like for me as an addict, I don't want them feelings. If I'm sad, you best give me something to get rid of sadness. Fear, no way, give me some drugs. You know, like that. My When I feel stuff, I don't like it. I'm not at ease with just right now. You're going to just sit and feel mm. afraid for a while and deal with that without trying to distract yourself from it. I liked the bit where you said... <clears throat> as well about kind of demystifying or de fetishizing the food like the cookie dough or whatever no longer having a kind of an imbued potency when it, like, i remember when i was like, having problems eating when i was adolescent i used to try and think while it was in my mouth saying what is it about this i mean all you're doing is turning masticating something into a fluid and then swallow why is this the salute i tried with my own awareness to see if i could unpick it somehow mm -hmm. like move it away from me 
I was not able to. Instead, it took you know sort of a different type of drug addiction. But what um, like what you said there, that's a that's a good. There's good stuff in that. There's good data in that. I think. Mm. What's the matter? Well, no, I'm just um, anticipating that the thing is like a lot of people will hear that um, and and won't have the same opinion as you and will think that it's kind of uh, dangerous or promoting unhealthy things. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> That's just tough, isn't it? All right, then maybe because you live in online hyper aware world, mm. uh, you're aware that people will gainsay and <laughs> contradict what you're saying. But like, do you, at some point do we have to accept that there are different ways of resolving the problems of being human that all of us are flawed and have made mistakes and will continue to but there are going to be some people that hear that and go oh my god that's going to work for me i want to try that i want to you know that there is as krishnamurti the uh, philosopher not the news bloke said because often when i mention him people go do you mean off the news and i have to go no i don't mean off the news i mean krishnamurti the philosopher truth is a pathless land Mm-hmm. meaning that we are all going to have to find our own part. And like WB Yeats says, uh, every artist must create their own religion, their yeah, own yeah, system. Look coming out with the quotes. Well, I've got two. Oh, got, any quotes. More? got any more? Yeah. I can, listen, don't think that you've unloaded me a quote <laughs> in two quotes. I can, I can quote. I'm a quoter. Okay. I could be cracking on with it. I, sometimes I write my own little quotes, <laughs> put my initials. You've got a few, oh, got a few books, haven't you? I've got maybe five. <sighs> Yeah. Hell. How many books you done? Oh, only the one. But you're when when I was 26, <laughs> I'd written zero books. Okay, I got so time. So actually, you're winning. <laughs> you're winning the book war. Yeah. What is that book? The book is uh, Body Positive Power. It mm. is basically absolutely everything that I have learned in these five years about uh, food and bodies, why we hate ourselves, how we can stop intuitive eating, good relationships with exercise. Uh, how we feel about fat, why we are so scared of the word fat and everything that fat entails and how to put it all together and hopefully just be a bit more peaceful in your body. That's really good. I'm going to check that out. Listen, I think um, you're going to have a big impact on the way that people understand these issues. You will participate in this conversation a lot and I think you'll help a lot of people and I, I like the way that you communicate and you've helped me to understand things I didn't understand before. Thanks for coming on, Megan. Thank you very much. I've had a lovely time. It's been good, hasn't it? It has. What about the bit where the chair fell? That was my favourite. So I think that's a highlight. That's a meme waiting to happen. Shit. <laughs> Just memed myself off. <laughs>